Warning. The following video contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. A complex spell flared into life as the old unicorn shuffled through the thin papers of an almost impossibly thick tome. The sigils and eldritch emblems hung flaming in the air as complex calculations weaved them together into a dense matrix of light. All about the tables were piles of books, beakers and jars of coloured fluids, all lit by the soft glow of many dribbling candles. The thick puddles of spent tallow on the cold stone floor, which streamed from wall sconces and dripped from the laden tables, gave some indication of just how long Starswell the Bearded had been at work on this particular thermological display. It was a more mundane device, however, a simple cuckoo clock, that chimed to let the old mage know that he was running late. With a grumble and a spark of light from his horn, the display was snuffed out, along with the candle flames. He moved to the single shuttered window afforded to his high tower, and threw open the shutters to the cold breeze, allowing some of the smoky air from within to drift out in tangled plumes. As his vision cleared and adjusted to the light, Starswell gazed out across the city. Snowflakes fell through the gathering twilight, and the unicorn could not help but smile as his eyes fell on the great spools of ribbon and garland that so festively decorated Cantalot. Bells rang out across the snow-wrapped city, bringing merriment and a lightness of the heart to all who heard them. Cantalot was beautiful in the winter, none could deny it, though there were many who remembered the bitter chill which had gripped their ancestral lands. Even those who had every reason to shun the season had to admit that the spires of the former Alicon Citadel sparkled and shone magnificently beneath the frost. Gathering up his cloaks, Starswell set out into the city. It had been very kind of the Alicorns to gift the city to the unified tribes of Equestria, the old unicorn thought, as with a jingle of bells from his own wide-brimmed hat, the unicorn moved through the busy streets to his destination. Though he was sure that it was as much a gift to their new princesses as to their people, having such a city as the new capital of Equestria could not help but bring pride to even the most jaded heart. One day, he really would have to get around to finding out what land or nation it was to which the other alicorns had retreated. But given their great generosity and their even greater power, he could leave them their mysteries for the time being. There were other matters of import for the fledgling nation, and it was Starswell the Bearded's intention to guide Equestria to the best of his ability. Part of maintaining order in the new nation, the old unicorn knew, was reminding it of its past. Already, there were new generations being born who never knew a time when the tribes had been divided by distrust and disharmony, as much as by hegemony. Yet even so, lest they be led to repeat the mistakes of the past, they would need to be educated on where it was that they had come from, and just how fragile was the harmony they now enjoyed. It had been the princesses themselves who had suggested that a play be commissioned. They had even set aside a grand hall, almost like unto a cathedral. Wondrous to behold, Starswell thought as he gazed up at the edifice. Even more so inside, as it was bedecked with boughs of holly, bright red ribbons and garlands of evergreen for the first performance. There were hopes, to be sure, that this might become something of an annual remembrance, and Starswell thought it very likely, given the sea of pony folk that filled the great hall from end to end. It was clear from all the bright and smiling faces that this was viewed as something of a novelty, not just for the viewing public, but by all involved. 
he could see the actors every now and again nervously twitch aside the voluminous curtains on stage to peek out at the growing crowd. It was possible that never before in the history of pony kind had any pony had such a large crowd to perform for. While the art form was not unknown in the high courts of the unicorns, the recent past had seen such performances fall out of favor. The unicorns had no time for such distractions when they were still expending their best and brightest on the raising of the sun and the moon. The pegasi, always of a more militaristic bent, saw such frivolities as a sign of weakness. Even the humble earth ponies had shunned what few traveling performers of farce and tragedy they had, for their lot in life had been farce and tragedy enough to contend with in and of itself. Of course, in the past what few plays were put on would have been for only one tribe at a time, and often only dealing with matters relevant to that tribe. Which is why Starswell had been surprised by the princess's suggestion, and even more surprised by how enthusiastically every pony else had supported the idea, joining in the creation of what Starswell hoped would stand as a potent symbol of harmony. A tale about coming together, despite distrust and differences, and forming unshakable bonds of friendship that would hopefully prove a shining example to all of Equestria. It was unfortunate then, to say the least, the look on some of the faces of those who sat in places of honour in the audience. Princess Luna and Princess Celestia themselves were in attendance, of course, wearing smiles that were just a little strained. The source of this problem was perhaps his own apprentice, Clover the Clever, who sat near them with a stormy look on her face. Clover had been by turns morose and frantic for the last few days, and it was likely that she viewed this play as nothing more than a distraction from the work to which she and Starswell had been so dedicated. It is better for us to take a break and enjoy the play, and be reminded of all the good things that have come from the founding of Equestria rather than dwelling on the dark problems of the moment. Then again, it was possible that the problem was Commander Hurricane, who sat ramrod straight and blank-faced on the other side of the princesses, flanked by a pair of armed Pegasus guards. The commander had been distant of late, but Starswell couldn't blame him. He hoped his friend would come around eventually, but he always had been a Pegasus of action, and it was clear he'd much rather be out scouring the land for enemies, rather than sitting in his officer's uniform in this stuffy and loud hall. Princess Platinum and King Bullion were in attendance, of course, but they wore the haughty, distant expressions of all nobility when surrounded by peasants. The only genuine smiles were worn by Smart Cookie and Chancellor Puddinghead. Of course, these last two did not yet know the reason for their other friend's agitation. Starswell would have to remedy that. But it can wait until after the play. It was starting now. The curtains were rising. The play began with a cold, wintry wind, the howl of a distant, unseen windigo, and the gentle falling of a few flakes of snow. I put quill to parchment today for the first time since I was a wee filly. It was my mother who first taught me. She had been a maidservant for a rich unicorn family in her youth that expected their staff to know the ways of writing to help teach the little lords and ladies. I find holding the quill more difficult than I remembered, but I welcome the distraction. I am keeping this journal purely for that purpose, after all. As a distraction. It has been a few months now since my husband and my little pumpkin disappeared, swallowed whole by the big city, or run off to warmer climes. I do not know which. I'd like to think that they did not abandon me willingly. But in my weaker moments, when the cold wind whistles through the cracks in the old homestead, I find that I can't blame them if they did choose to leave me behind. After all, I barely looked for them more than a few days when they first disappeared. 
coward that I am. It doesn't do to dwell on such things. Even so, what few friends I have left seem to think it might help me some to get my true feelings out with this diary, since I've staunchly refused to open up to them. I know I'm by no means the only widow, nor even the only mother who's lost a child in these parts. But at least those mares had a body to bury. At least they could grieve. I feel as though I'm stuck perpetually on the verge of mourning. Yet even so, part of me expects that cabbage-headed husband of mine to come through the door at any moment with some tale of wild adventure or lame excuse. Our little pumpkin bounding at his hooves. At this point, I don't know if I would hug him or bash his head in for all this worry. Since it's just me that's likely to read this, I don't feel ashamed to say that I spent most days in the parlor here, at home, in hopes that I could find out which. Idle fancies, I fear. Not good for a lonely heart. My friends have suggested I try searching for them again. But I've heard terrible rumors of disappearances and death in the castle town as of late. While it's possible my loved ones could be victims of the same, it would do them no good if I were to be spirited away as well and they come home to an empty house. Would they know I had searched for them? Would they think I had abandoned them, as I fear they have abandoned me? No, I can't face the city and all those horn heads looking down their noses at the mad widow wandering the streets in search of a lost husband and daughter. Like as not, I'd end up in their dungeons for my own good. I fear all I can do is wait tending to the farm as best I can in this unnatural cold, and hope that someday they will return to me, or someday I'll be brave enough to let go. Thank the sun and the moon and all the shining stars in the sky. My little one returned to me today. My little pumpkin. It happened when I was in the wood on the edge of the farm, chipping away at an old oak tree for the stove. I could barely see her as dusk was coming on and the shadows were growing thick. But I knew it was her as soon as she called out to me. She wore different cloths and seemed unsteady on her hooves. But still she had the same sweet voice of my little Billy, and we embraced for so long, snow had time to settle in our hair. She was so small and fragile, such a delicate thing. She barely seemed to weigh anything at all. I got her inside and next to the cherry red stove as quick as I could. She was a ravenous little thing, which wasn't surprising since... She was skin and bones, so we shared a meal. The first family meal since she disappeared. We chatted, of course, though I can barely remember what about. This has all just been one huge whirlwind for me. In truth, I fear I may be dreaming, or telling a little fib to myself in my waking hours. But no... I can hear her even now, the clip-clopping of her little hooves as she moves about her room, bringing a warmth to my heart I have not felt in ages. The hour is late. I can only imagine what would stir her from her slumber. Nightmares, most likely, about the ordeal she went through getting home. Or perhaps what was done to her in that wicked city. I want to ask her, but part of me wonders if 
I really want to know the truth about what happened to her. Part of me just thinks I should be happy to have her back and just let whatever happened be. But I know that's not right. If some pony hurt my little pumpkin, as much as it sickens me to think about, I need to know. I need to see them brought to justice for taking her away from me and doing who knows what to her. And her father. How could I have forgotten her cabbage head of a father? Does she know what happened to him as well? Did he abandon her? I could never believe that of him. Not in my wildest dreams. But then, where is he? Have I regained a daughter only to lose any hope of seeing my husband ever again? It does me no good to work myself up like this. But I know such bittersweet thoughts will haunt my dreams tonight. I fear, like my little one, I will have a hard time sleeping. Still, I will wait until morning to question my daughter. Undoubtedly, she has been through much to return to me, and I wouldn't think of tormenting her by bombarding her with questions at this late hour. Perhaps tomorrow, over breakfast. Though our food stores are running low thanks to this blasted weather, I will make a homecoming feast the likes of which no pony has eaten before. I place pen to parchment once again, though weakly. Still, I must get these words down, lest the thoughts in my head burst out of their own accord and fly off on gossamer wings from my fevered brain. I have fallen ill. The suddenness and severity of my malady is worse than any I've experienced before in my life. I find myself dizzy and delirious by turns, unable to so much as rise from my bed for fear of what I might see and what I might hear. The smells are the worst, and sometimes I'm not sure if they're real or imagined. But I'm running away from my fears, even as I try to put them on paper. I must not falter. I must face the things I dread. My daughter is not my daughter. I know that sounds strange and like the ravings of a diseased mind. But I swear now that this is something I've suspected ever since she returned home. At first I tried to explain it away as a product of whatever ordeal she had been through. Whenever I asked about what happened to her, she was vague and evasive. Even more so when I asked after her father what had become of him. She was never one for telling lies before. But I fear she's lying to me now when she says she doesn't know what became of him. There's something in her eyes that makes me think she knows exactly what happened to Cabbage Patch. And those eyes, were they always that faded a shade of green? Was her scarlet mane always so wild and unmanageable? I remember once her happy voice filled our home with joy as she sang little songs she made up to entertain herself. Now, she only sings one song, over and over and over, just under her breath between giggling fits. Either the ordeal of my child has been through, has driven her slightly mad, or... Or I fear something darker. From my mother, I heard tales of creatures that once plagued the pony tribes. They were beasts that took the faces of your loved ones and took their place, made you believe they were the genuine article, and then slowly drained their victim's love away. 
Is it possible that one such creature stole the face of my child and used it to worm its way into my home? Into my heart? Is that why I've fallen so desperately ill and my daughter seems so strange? If it were true, I'm not sure how I would really feel. I should be outraged, I know. But I was so happy to have her back. Even it is all just a lie. Such treacherous feelings make it difficult for me to know what to believe. There are reasons to doubt these suspicions, of course. For instance, how would such a creature learn of my loss? Most of my neighbors have moved away, trying to escape the bitter cold. And why choose my daughter instead of my husband? While it's true I loved my baby girl, no one can say I did not love my husband truly. I fear these thoughts make me doubt exactly how truly. And that's something I wish to not dwell on in my sick bed. Truth be told, it's not just my daughter that is strange to me these days, but the very house itself. I feel like a stranger in my own home. Doors seem to appear and disappear from day to day. I swear the forest looks somehow closer at night. Though even I realize it's foolish to think the trees have moved. But the voices, the screams, drifting from those dark woods. Am I truly imagining those? Am I dreaming? They're almost as awful as the strange smells that flood the house when I'm trying to sleep. Sometimes it's achingly sweet. Sweeter than the fields in springtime with all the flowers in bloom. Other times it's putrid, like the worst rot and decay you could imagine. All mildewing and festering like the underside of a dried up bog. I know the simplest explanation is not that my daughter is secretly a monster. Or my old homestead has taken on a life of its own. I know that the fault must lie with me. But I've never been this sick before. This lost in my own home. My own head. We're running low on food. Or at least we should be. For all my complaints about her strangeness, my little pumpkin has been dutiful in caring for me. She brings me a hot bowl of stew for most meals. Though, for the life of me, I know not what she's using for ingredients. It's thick and rich and a little creamy. No doubt very nourishing as well. It's nothing I ever taught her how to make. Even so, that's hardly something to be suspicious about, isn't it? I hear her coming back now. I think she's fetching me an extra blanket before I try to get a little more rest. I must hide this diary. I wouldn't want my sweet daughter to ever read these words. I don't want her to know her mother's crazy delusions. Am I still ill? My fever broke some time ago. I'm still a little weak, but I'm strong enough to move about the house. A bitter storm rages outside as I write this, and has for a few days now. Or has it been longer? Time has lost its meaning for me. Part of me wants to go out. To get a breath of fresh air. The stench of this house. What I realize to be the smell of my own sickness. Assaults my nostrils constantly. 
You'd think I'd grown used to it by now. But every now and again, some stealthy vapor or gentle gust of perfumed air will tickle my nose, and I will feel the same sickness and revulsion as before creeping over me. My daughter has been staying away from me by my express command. Whatever ailment I had, I didn't want to risk her catching it as well. I couldn't stand the thought of losing her to an illness after so recently having her reunited to me. At least, that's how I felt at first. I'm sure that's what I meant. Only... Once she was no longer fussing over me, that's when I started to feel a little better. I fear my mind, however, began to wander even more. What was she doing while the storm howled outside? Was she getting fresh wood to keep the house so warm and toasty? Where was she getting the food? that I now know must be all but exhausted. The rich stool she left at my bedroom door was always piping hot and just as good as my first spoonful. Was she actually weathering the storm to keep me in such comfort? How could her tiny, fragile frame withstand the bitter cold? She is at her least active during the day. Instead, moving about the house the most at night. Once I was no longer drifting in and out of sleep, I stayed up for a night, just to listen. I don't know what drove me. Insomnia? Paranoia? All I know is that I swear I heard the front door open and close in the dead of night. A silence fell over the house that chilled me to the bone. I swear I could hear her tiny voice drifting beneath my window. For the first time, I listened, really listened, to the words of the song she sings to herself when she thinks I can't hear. It wasn't until that song... That laughter had dwindled into the distance that I dared rise from my bed and lock my bedroom door. That settles it. I'm afraid she is no daughter of mine. She is a wolf in sheep's clothing. I pray that I have gone mad. I dare not write in the dark, for I know that I am never alone in darkness. It is the bright of day outside, or at least I think it must be, the light that filters fitfully through the clouds above seems like daylight to me. The world outside my window is nothing but dull gray and white for as far as I can see. But even so, it's not nearly as bleak as my home has become. Nothing makes sense in this place anymore. I wonder sometimes, have I died? Is this Tartarus? Is this house meant to be my prison for the rest of eternity? Is my daughter my smiling jailer? Every time I think of escape, the doors lead to new rooms or blank walls, never outside. The windows, too, are fastened tight, and try as I might, I cannot break the thick glass. How I wish I could break off just one tiny shard. How I long for even a glimpse of freedom. Even if it came at the edge of a piece of glass. 
There are so many things I regret now. I regret agreeing to let my little girl go to the castle town. I regret not being there to protect her. I regret welcoming her home. Or rather, that thing that wears her smile, sings with her voice, and smells of death and candy. I regret knowing what it is I've been eating these past months. Knowing that if I try to stop eating, she'll force feed me. I regret hearing them crying under the floorboards. I regret not being able to do anything for them. Not being able to do anything for myself. I regret going down to the cellar in the first place. Seeing that thing crawl out of the pony I had mistook for my daughter. She came sliding effortlessly out of the dead girl's lifeless mouth and riding into the ship of another filly altogether in the darkness. I regret seeing her smiling and laughing as she gorged herself on the poor unfortunates that shivered, broken in the dark below my house. Candy teeth gleaming dully beneath a bloody sheen. I had heard whispers about the disappearances at the castle town. It's true, but I hadn't believed them. A pony made of candy that lures away children, that plays evil little tricks, that can take down a grown stallion and strip the flesh from his bones in moments with a candy corn smile. <laughs> Foolishness. <laughs> Foolishness. Rumor and poppycock. I regret not believing. I regret being alive. Overhead, the sky was a uniform white. The heavens mirrored the ground below, where two ponies trod carefully. Their hooves crunched through the crust of sparkling frost and plunged down into a thick layer of dirty snow. The drifts here were old, only slightly dusted with a few dry flakes which skittered and danced across the crisp surface. Beneath a thin layer of ice hid the tangled roots and long-dead briar of the sleeping forest, and these seemed to rise up like cold, dead claws to snag in the pony's cloaks. The older filly helped the colt extricate his leg. Careful now! Step where I step and the going will be easier. There's no telling what lies beneath the surface here, and we can't afford to delay. We gotta keep moving. We have to keep warm. They were woefully unprepared for the circumstances in which they found themselves. Both wore ragged, threadbare cloaks that did little to keep out the chill. Fortunately, the old woods were thick. Most of the new snow was suspended above them, cradled in the twisted, winding limbs of the bare trees. Thick as the woods grew, this place would be lit only in patches of light and shadow, even in high summer. As it was, in the dead of winter, it felt less like they were moving through a forest, and more like they were travelling through a network of caves. Barely any light reached them, though the one advantage of this was that the trees blocked out most of the savage wind. They could hear it howling above as the storm raged on, and were thankful that they were spared the brunt of that vicious gale. Even so, an occasional blast of wind would scythe through the trees and bite deep into their flesh, chilling them to the bone and urging them onward in search of shelter. Oh, but Gretel, 
I'm so t- tired, intoned the weary colt, his teeth chattering. Oh, can't we rest for just a moment? I can feel the chill traveling up my legs, working at my bones. I fear if I do not stop to warm myself, I shall f- freeze. Their voices sounded oddly loud in the stillness that gripped the woods, though their frigid lungs could barely manage more than a whisper. Small showers of snow fell all around them, leaking between the tree limbs above the quiet hiss. If we were to stop, then we would certainly freeze, dear Hans. The filly grimly moved closer to her brother to share some of her warmth. Gretel was a bit warmer than her brother, but only just. Stop in place if you must, but we have to keep going. We have to find a way out of this forest, or at least some kind of shelter before night falls. We haven't much time. Even as she said this, what little light they had beneath the canopy of snow and twisted limbs seemed to fade. The storm was growing worse. It would not be long until what little illumination they had was extinguished altogether. Soon, they would be in a world of nothing but darkness and snow, with naught but bare tree bark for comfort and a blanket of snow to keep themselves warm. Gretel didn't want to spend another sleepless night crouched in a bush or beneath evergreen boughs, bent by snow, worrying that they wouldn't have enough strength to extract themselves in the morning. Or, worse, worrying that her brother might stop breathing in the night, his lungs frozen from the inside out, leaving her with only his corpse for company. It felt like it had been days since the pair of earth ponies had lost their way. They had been travelling with their mother and father after hearing of a land far to the south where the breezes were warm and there fell soft rains instead of sleet. Mother had cautioned not to get their hopes up. After fighting the ice and snow so long, she regarded even whispers of warmth as something of a fairy tale. But even she had brightened once they had started travelling. The thought of a land full of rich, dark soil, not frozen hard and locked away beneath a layer of frost, was just too tempting to ignore. They would have to start over, but the old farm hadn't produced more than a few scraggly strawberries in months anyway, so that didn't really matter. It had been time to move on. Perhaps it had actually been past time. Many families had already moved south before the blizzard came upon the travelling family. If only Gretel and Hansel's parents had been travelling in one of the earlier caravans instead of on their own, they might never have been separated. Then again, perhaps not. The storm had sprung up like a wall of white, distorting the land and threatening to sap the life from them. Some dark shape moved in the whiteout, and though they could not see what it was, The shrieks and screams of their parents told them they did not want to find out. The siblings had been extremely lucky to find the scant shelter they had in the shadows of the Black Forest. Even if it meant they were now hopelessly lost, at least they were alive and still together. Thinking about her parents made Gretel's eyes tear up, but she forced herself not to cry. It was just that there was no way of knowing for sure if her mother and father had survived. While they were hardy earth ponies, being powerfully built and used to the hardship that came with working the land, they hadn't just been fighting the cold, but whatever had come swooping out of the storm. Her parents might be okay, she told herself, but she knew, even if they had survived whatever attacked their caravan, that even the hardiest ponies could still find themselves dead beneath a layer of snow in a matter of moments in this blizzard. She sniffled slightly, but that was all she would allow herself. She had to stay strong for her brother. Falling to pieces now would only ensure their own deaths. Gathering up her brother and shielding him with her cloak, the pair trudged on, searching for the path they had lost so long ago, searching for their parents, or at least hoping to find a little food and a bit of shelter. The wind whistled mournfully overhead, a harsh accompaniment to the sound of their chattering teeth and the loud groans of their empty stomachs. Their last meal had not been particularly filling, the rations one eats while travelling rarely being served hot or in large amounts. Even that meagre fare was deeply missed now. 
The pair had not found more than a few berries since becoming lost, which Gretel was sure had to be poisonous. Nothing should be so bright a shade of red in these freezing temperatures. Though it was far more likely they would die of cold and exposure before long, the angry pangs of hunger coming from their weakening bodies did not make their fight for survival any easier. Which is when Hansel first cried out. Do you smell that, Gretty? She thought they were finally going mad. The scent that came to her nostrils couldn't possibly be here in the wilderness. Gingerbread! I smell gingerbread! Why would there be gingerbread in the middle of the forest? It did not make any sense. Hansel, energized by the smell, dashed off through the snow, following his nose. Wait! Hans! Don't rush off! We have to stay again! Her cry died on her lips. It can't be! Her brother stood stock still, just before a wide clearing. The field, or perhaps farmland, for she thought she recognized the trappings of one, was perfectly frozen. A vast expanse of sparkling white beneath a sky of the same black hue almost glowed in the shadow-free light. The only spot of color lay in the middle of the clearing, where stood a small cottage. This should have been cause for cheer. The curling smoke coming from the stovepipe and the light spilling from its thick windows promising warmth and safety within. Yet the entire edifice, from porch to roof, was a riot of bright and chaotic color, almost as though it were made of candy instead of wood and spackle. Indeed, from the smell, it didn't just look to be made of sweets, but in fact was composed of more candy than the children had seen in their entire lives. Even the snow that sat on the low cottage roof and hung from it in tapering icicles appeared to be made from thick and creamy frosting. The scent of it hung heavy in the cold air, and the warm sweet aroma caused their mouths to water even as they stared in wonder and amazement. It can't be! I'm mad! I can't stop raving mad! If this was some delusion or hallucination, it seemed that Hansel shared it. The colt bounded across the clearing, leaving small hoof prints on the spotless snow. As soon as he reached the cottage, he immediately broke off a shingle from the low-hanging roof and greedily began to gobble it down. As quick as he downed the roof tile, he might have tried to eat the entire roof if his sister had not come up and smacked the bit of gingerbread from his hooves. What do you think you're doing? Going around and eating other ponies' houses? You could have at least asked first! Oh, but I'm so hungry! So am I! But if this place is real, we need to be cautious. Can you think of any reason some pony would build something like this out in the middle of nowhere? To keep it all for themselves? Perhaps. Or perhaps to lure in weary and hungry travelers for their own ends. As if on cue, the front door of the cottage creaked open. A blast of warm, sweet air washed over the shivering siblings. It felt so good, Gretel thought she would melt right then and there. It seemed the door had swung open on its own, though there was no pony there to greet them. Though she could resist the temptation to devour the candy cottage, her body would not let her forsake the warmth of the inviting home. It did not help matters that they were completely exposed to the wind in this clearing. When the options were to enter a warm cottage, or take their chances back beneath the scant shelter of the Black Forest, the choice was obvious. Be on your guard, Hans, whispered his sister, before calling out in a slightly louder voice. Hello? Is any pony here? We mean you no harm. We're just two hungry travelers who got lost in the storm. We were hoping it might be all right to come in and warm up bones for a spell. No pony answered. It seemed whoever owned this cottage was out at the moment. The pair walked over the threshold of the cottage, closing the door gently behind them. They found themselves in what looked like a sitting room. Pictures were hung on the walls, and knick-knacks and bric-a-brac were strewn here and there, across shelves, tables and cabinets. 
While the outside had been a fantastic masterpiece of confection, the inside reminded the siblings almost hauntingly of their old homestead. Just like the outside, however, everything from the couch to the throw rug to the tiny crystal figurines on a shelf all seemed to be made of candy. Even the floor beneath their hooves, though it looked like hardwood, had the consistency of fudge. They could not help wandering further into the tiny cottage, exploring the bizarre yet familiar home, moving towards the source of warmth and light in the next room. They moved through a hallway decorated with candy portraits and framed landscapes. These had an elementary roughness to them that seemed less like artwork to Gretel and more like the crude drawings a young filly might create and display proudly on her bedroom wall. Beyond the hallway, they came to what looked like a kitchen. A door set in the far wall led back outside, and another doorway yawned open, leading into what looked like a bedroom. There was also a set of stairs by the hall where they had entered that appeared to lead up to a loft. As had been the case so far, everything in this room seemed to be made of sweets as well. Pots and pans, knives and spoons, all hung from candy cane hooks on the wall. Even the source of light and heat, the merry crackling stove, was in the shape of a pumpkin with a wide grin for a grating. Gretel could not help but feel that the jack-o'-lantern's eyes, with their flickering flames, were watching her. But that was a ridiculous thought. It was probably just the strange gaze of the pictures in the hall. Despite their crude nature, the lollipop eyes the portraits possessed seemed to follow her around the tiny kitchen. Oh, 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 hey, look what I found! Hansel had tripped over a small handle set in the floor. As the colt bit the handle and started to lift, a section of the floor began to rise. He'd found a trap door that led down into some sort of root cellar. Just as he was about to lift it higher so they could have a peek inside, a hoof slammed down on the door, causing Hansel to fall flat on his face. Get out! Get out now! Gretel gasped and took an involuntary step back. She had no idea where the other pony had come from, but she was hideous. Old and wrinkled, the mare's grey hair was dishevelled and hung in filthy clumps around her face. Her clothes were worse, mere rags, and completely unsuited for a cold climate. A witch! It all made sense now. They had stumbled into some witch's enchanted cottage. You shouldn't be here. Get out! Get out now! The witch whispered urgently. She advanced on the pair of children, eyes wild. For their part, they backed quickly out of the kitchen and into the hallway. I'm sorry, ma'am. We didn't know you were home. We were just trying to find a place to warm ourselves. Gretel drew her brother protectively close. And have a bite to, to eat, stammered Hansel. She elbowed her brother hard in the ribs. This seemed to cause the old hag to pause. Eat? She leaned uncomfortably close as the children found their backs against a wall. Eat, did you say? Have you two eaten something? No? Yes! They both yelled truthfully. Gretel knew what happened to folks who lied to witches. The stories always said they were turned into toads. Though the cold outside already bit her flanks hard, she could not imagine what it would be like in the slimy skin of a toad. She didn't want to find out, so she blurted out the truth frantically. My brother ate a piece of your cottage, but please don't be angry. We were just so hungry, ma'am. He didn't know any better. <sighs> That caused the old mare to snort, though her eyes lost some of their wildness to sadness. No, no, I believe you, child. I doubt very much the little tyke knew what he was doing. Her whisper was bitter. Without warning, she suddenly grabbed Hansel and hauled him back into the kitchen. Get while you still can, girl, and never come back. Better you die in the snow than see what fate awaits him here. Gretty, sis! Hansel cried out, 
as the filthy mare dragged him to the very trapdoor he had found before. The hag flung it open, revealing its dark depths to the firelight as she flung the boy inside. <coughs> Without thinking, Gretel leaped in after him. No! You stupid Billy! You don't want to go down there! The witch hadn't raised her voice the entire time, though she had whispered frantically. Now, however, she screeched loud enough to wake the dead. By the stove light that filtered in from above, Gretel thought she could see why. Down here in the darkness, hanging from candy cane hooks and piled on marzipan trestles, was one pony carcass after another. Some had been skinned and smoked, their headless bodies hanging from the ceiling. Others still lay mostly intact, soaking in barrels of salt or brine, their eyes milky, and faces stretched by rigor mortis grins. They were mostly children, fillies and colts, a few tiny foals, all stretched and splayed and dripping as far as the eye could see in the flickering light. Gretel was going to be sick. Hansel, for his part, already was. He was vomiting, violently, a dark mixture of gingerbread and blood. She had to get him out of here, now. Grabbing her brother, she tried to pull him back up the ladder. The hag met her at the top. Move, you witch! You beast! You're not going to have me and my brother for your sick water! Move or I'll break every brittle bone in your shriveled up body! The filly howled with anger and fear, meaning every word. To her surprise, the old mare backed away and let her up into the kitchen. You don't understand! You don't understand! You have to leave him! It's the only way! Leave him and run! The old hag was frantic, pawing the floor with her hooves, strands of her filthy hair sticking to her cracked lips. Just then, the soft sound of children's laughter echoed from the loft above. The change in the old hag was immediate, every inch of her shivering as if she were gripped by a terrible chill. To Gretel's amazement, the disheveled mare began to weep. (laughs) What's that then? More victims? More falls to your slaughter? Gretel backed herself and Hansel toward the nearest exit. No, child. I, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. The old mare blubbered like an injured child. That's not the lamb you hear bleating. That's the wolf. The wolf. Gretel turned to spring out of the back door and slammed into a blank wall. Where there had been a door before, there was nothing but a smooth surface. She whirled back around. The entire kitchen had changed. Gone were the doors leading from it and the trap door that had hidden the nightmare below. The entire room seemed to twist and distort as she watched, stretching and shrinking like a living thing. Everything had taken on a more sinister light even the oven's goofy pumpkin grin having turned into a sinister, sharp-toothed smile. Gretel could have sworn that she could see faces leering from within the flames. Witch! I don't know what magic this is, but you best let me and my brother go! I'm warning you! A parent is sure to be looking for us! (laughs) It's not my choice! (laughs) I would if I could! I would if I could! (laughs) The entire kitchen seemed to warp and move. Candies detached from places all over the room, slithering to a spot just behind the old mare. Bit by bit, piece by piece, something took shape at her side. In a blink, a filly, made entirely out of sweets, stood by the weeping biddy. The strange creature raised a hoof 
and stroked the hag's sticky hair. Don't worry, they'll disappear soon enough. <laughs> the filly giggled as the crone's head sank into her hooves. The creature's candy-swirled eyes flashed behind bits of her red and black licorice mane. Hello, boys and girls. Would you like something sweet to bite? Gretel didn't know what was going on, but she had to find a way out, if not for herself, then for her brother. <coughs> at that moment, Hansel slumped at her side. <laughs> I don't feel so good, Gretty, he muttered, before more blood and vomit shot from his mouth. Gretel started screaming as she watched her little brother's flesh pop and tear, skin ripping to tattered shreds before her eyes. Hansel! Please! Hansel! What's happened to you? She watched, helpless and disbelieving, as something shiny and sweet slithered from the fleshy sheath that had been Hansel. This new pony, which looked much like her brother, save for being composed entirely of gingerbread, grinned cheerfully at its former sister. Its gumdrop eyes sparkled as it moved toward her, and before she could move, took a bite from her rosy cheek. <coughs> the filly flung herself back, still screaming as she held a hoof over the ragged wound on her face. This was a nightmare. It had to be a nightmare. As if reading her mind, the filly above them began to sing mockingly. Nightmare night, what a fright. Time for something sweet to bite. <laughs> it was then that it finally dawned on Gretel what was going on. The candy mare. Every filly had heard the stories of foals led astray by sweets, never to be heard from again. Every colt had whispered to friends of dark and devious tricks, played on the unsuspecting in the middle of dark nights, that ended in death. But that all happened on Nightmare Night, when the farmers and villagers would leave out sugary peace offerings and lock themselves tight inside their homes until daybreak. Nightmare Night had been months ago. Why was the candy mare here now, in deepest winter? What was going on? <laughs> Nightmare night, what a fright. Time for something sweet to bite. <laughs> Gretel didn't know what she expected to happen next. But watching the candy filly swell in size and crash into the gingerbread Hansel in a wave of teeth and claws was not it. The thing that used to be her brother squealed and gave a warbling shriek as hunks of its body were devoured greedily. The sound was all the more gut-wrenching since Gretel could hear bits and pieces of her little brother's voice buried in those distorted screams. Before her eyes, the candy mare devoured the gingerbread abomination and licked up the gory pile of what had once been her little brother. The sick scene left her speechless. What could she do against such a bizarre creature? There was no escape, no hope. What was she supposed to do? <laughs> muttered the old hag over and over as the candy mare licked blood from her smile with a long taffy tongue. But the monster wasn't done. Licorice hair moved of its own accord like a living thing, snaking across the kitchen floor and wrapping around each of Gretel's limbs before she could so much as blink. She could feel the fronds biting deep into her flesh, breaking the skin. Panicking, she tried desperately to shake off the monster's vice-like grip, but it was far too late. 
The tendrils of candy lifted her into the air, almost bringing her up to the ceiling, droplets of her blood falling with a pitter-patter on the floor below. Now do never show. This was to the old pony, though the candy mare never took her eyes off Gretel. Those terrifying, mad candy-swirled eyes moved hungrily over her body. It's been a long time since I've cooked for you, and even longer since you've had a hot meal. I think it looks like I'm both at, don't you? The candy monster dragged Gretel forcefully across the ceiling until she was right above the blazing stove. The jack-o'-lantern's smile had turned completely into a hungry moor. The flames within leaping excitedly, as if they too were starving. Bit by bit, the candy mare lowered the young pony carefully over the flames. The fire hissed as Gretel's blood dribbled down her limbs and into the fiery mouth, leaping higher to sear her blistering flesh. The pain was excruciating, making her scream between sobs, her frantic writhing useless as she struggled to loosen the grip of the tendrils. Her tiny hooves kicked in the air. A coughing fit burst from her throat as her mane and tail began to singe, then to burn. She could feel the blisters swelling and popping on her legs as they came closer and closer to the heat, sores bursting and dripping blood and liquid fat over the pumpkin stove's grin. The candy mare only laughed in delight and insanity, as Gretel was roasted alive. Eventually, the flames engulfed her tiny body completely, a long tongue of fire licking through her tail and into her mane. The flames quickly washed over the rest of her body. Gretel could feel her skin peel away and her muscles tighten as the moisture in her body began to escape from her steaming flesh. The candy mare's own licorice whip hair melted away in the heat, leaving Gretel to fall unceremoniously into the oven. Her world turned into a wall of orange light. Oddly, the pain seemed to fade away, agony transmuting into a coldness that gripped her to her core. A thought came to her pain-numbed mind that even in the heart of so hot a flame, even at death's door, she could not escape the cold. As Gretel's eyes popped, melting and running down her cheeks, her brain flashed images and sounds that were strange to her dying senses. As her brain at last succumbed to the heat, she almost contentedly wondered why it was taking so long to die. As she felt her awareness fading, she couldn't help but wonder, what was that delicious smell? <laughs> <laughs>